ideal way to develop combat skill against an enemy aircraft would be to fly the enemy aircraft yourself before you had to fight it. Of course, that's an impossible ideal. Or is it? U.S. pilots flying combat over North Vietnam will never see a MiG-21 on the ground at close range, much less get a chance to fly it. Tactical Air Command and Navy fighter and attack pilots recently completed a thorough evaluation of the MiG-21 weapon system, analyzing it in an operational environment with all United States combat aircraft. The purpose of this tactical evaluation was to identify deficiencies and limitations which could be exploited to defeat the MiG-21. Air combat maneuvering situations which simulated the Southeast Asian operating environment were set up, and tactical maneuvers were flown in order to validate their effectiveness against the MiG-21. The lessons learned could save you and get your name on the list of MiG killers. Here to describe the results of the evaluation and discuss the recommended maneuvers are two of the primary pilots who flew the MiG-21 in this project. Lieutenant Colonel Joe B. Jordan, Tactical Air Command, and Commander Thomas J. Cassidy, Navy Air Development Squadron 4. The purpose of Project Have Donut was the tactical exploitation of the MiG-21 airplane. We compared the MiG-21 with all Air Force and Navy fighter and attack airplanes, flying over 100 sorties. The majority of the flights were tactical, however several flights were devoted to the performance and stability envelope of the airplane. Several flights were flown for electronic intelligence gathering. Colonel Jordan flew the MiG-21 against all U.S. Air Force tactical airplanes. I flew the MiG-21 against all Navy fighter and attack airplanes. During the program, we exchanged several flights in an effort to compare tactical data. Joe, would you point out some of the uh, performance uh, characteristics of the MiG-21? This MiG-21F-13 Bay Fighter is a rugged, small, highly maneuverable, extremely reliable Mach 2 aircraft. It's capable of high G and low speed flight. We flew it as low as 120 knots in a tactical maneuvering situation. The aircraft has an excellent zoom capability and max power and an impressive turn capability due to its high thrust to weight ratio and low wing loading. The airspeed bleed off in a high G sustained turn is very rapid below 400 knots due to its delta wing plan form. This large model is the all weather version. It's a fish bed B. The general appearance and most of the detailed features are almost identical to the one we flew. The pitot boom is mounted on the lower intake and is fitted with angle of attack and side slip vanes which feed into the gun sight system. The inlet spike is uh, movable, normally fully automatic, has a manual feature of positioning of 1.5 Mach number. It also houses the range-only radar for the gun sight. A permanently mounted pylon is fixed on the center line. It's capable of carrying a drop tank or a bomb. Outboard pylons are installed on the wings, capable of carrying atoll missiles, bombs, or rockets. One stall fence is located on either side of the outboard wingtips. The flight control systems include an irreversible, hydraulically actuated stabilator. It has a stabilator ratio controller installed. It restricts stabilator movement below 16,000 feet 
and above 32,000 feet. It's also further restricted uh, at high Q, approximately 510 knots below 16,000 feet. The rudder is manually actuated. The ailerons are manually actuated, hydraulically boosted. The cockpit is very small and narrow. The instruments and switches are crewed by our standards. forward hinged clamshell canopy is very narrow, as Tom said. It restricts your head movement considerably in flight. In addition to this, there's a metal flap right up over your head. When you look around, for example, to see if there's someone on your tail like this, it completely blocks your vision in the rear area. Modifications to the aircraft in order to obtain good data included the installation of American instruments. We installed a G-meter, an airspeed indicator, an altimeter, and a Mach meter. Over-the-shoulder cameras were mounted on the pilot seat on either side of the cockpit to photograph the cockpit instruments in flight. The aircraft is equipped with selectable three-wheel air-operated brakes used for both wheel braking on takeoff and landing and taxing. The engine acceleration is very slow, taking about 55 seconds to start and achieve idle power, and taking 15 seconds from idle to military power on run-up at the end of the runway. The afterburner will not light until you reach full military power, and it takes about three to five seconds. Takeoff is normal. The rudder becomes effective at about 30 knots. Rotation at about 140 knots, left off at about 170 knots. Gear retraction is normal, however, we have a neutral position on the wheel selector handle, which is uh, not common in our airplanes. Acceleration to climb speed of about 400 knots to 0.88 Mach compares with the F-8 airplane. 0.88 is held to altitude. The airplane will climb at uh, practically any speed above 250 knots. Forward visibility through the sight combining and bulletproof glass seriously degrades acquisition of targets. In this area, F-4 and F-8 aircraft can normally be acquired within three to five nautical miles. Smoke trail sightings on our aircraft have been made beyond 15 miles from the forward side panel. Visibility to the rear is restricted in a 50 to 60 degree cone due to aircraft structure low pilot's sitting position, and the narrow canopy. Side visibility and level flight is restricted to about 20 degrees below the horizon. Upper visibility, again restricted by the seat flap. From the side view, you can see that you are limited to a rather narrow area. Overall, the restricted visibility from the MiG is a very serious tactical limitation. The aircraft is vulnerable, uh, much like most of our fighters, but maybe even more so. First, let's take a look. The engine, the fuel tanks, and the combination of the high-pressure air bottles. As you can see, this covers about 80% of the aircraft's total surface. The airplane has an excellent speed and performance envelope. It's capable of Mach 2 flight at high altitude. Below 16,000 feet, we're airframe limited to 595 knots. Above 16,000 feet, 640 knots. Uh, during our evaluation, we encountered a duck buzz at about 0.93 Mach number. That's very difficult uh, to exceed 0.93. 510 knots, you get very heavy longitudinal stick forces. That tends to limit the amount of stabilator available, thereby limiting the uh, total number of G available. The turn capability of the airplane is excellent. At about 500 knots, you can sustain over 6 G at 15,000 feet. However, at 400 knots and below, speed bleed off in a high G turn is excessive. And this is one point that we can capitalize on with our airplanes. We can pull about 
3 G at 280 knots and about 2.5 G at 180 knots. The airplane is maneuverable down to 120 knots. It, uh, it takes quite a bit of cross controlling and pilot technique to keep from losing the airplane. This duck buzz or whatever occurs at low altitude between 9.3 and 9.5 Mach number could be airframe buffet, duck buzz, or I'm not sure what. Whatever it is, the airplane starts shaking and vibrating so bad you can hardly read the instrument panel. The basic gun sight compares with the capabilities of that in the F-100 and the F-8. Having a depressible pipper, a wing spanner, a manual ranging capability, two range meters for the automatic lock-on capability, one for guns and thousands of meters, and one in kilometers for missiles. It has an in-range, a breakaway, and a G-limit light for missiles only, a trigger and electrical cage button on the control stick grip. We found that in gun tracking, that we had normal lock-ons out beyond the gun range with no problem, but above two to three Gs in a tracking situation, we had quite a bit of gyro drift. It required continually electrically caging the button and letting it drift back. Also, we found that there was considerable pipper jitter during gun firing, which precluded tracking uh, corrections during the gun firing. Here's a 30, 30 millimeter shell case from one of our firings. As you can see, it's quite a bit larger than ours. It carries a very lethal load if you happen to be hit with it. One interesting thing we found out about the aircraft is that the IR signature of the MiG is some 40 to 70 percent greater than our comparable aircraft, such as the F-104. Tom, how about giving us some size comparisons with the uh, MiG and some of our aircraft. One of the most apparent things uh, we discovered during the program was the uh, small size of the MiG-21. It gave us a lot of problems in the tactical evaluation phase uh, since we continually lost sight of the airplane. It took quite a bit of training for the pilots to realize that the airplane was small, uh, the lack of smoke trail it, uh, initially made it extremely difficult to keep the airplane in sight. We have some scale model silhouettes of various large airplanes that we're employing in Southeast Asia. The F-100, which is obviously larger than the MiG-21, yet in flight closely resembles the MiG-21. The F-105 is an obviously much larger airplane. And in flight, uh, there is no comparison uh, as far as silhouette goes. The F-8 is much larger than the MiG-21, yet in flight, from many aspects, it looks the same as the MiG-21, especially the side-on view. The F-4, again, is much larger, leaves quite a bit of smoke, and is easily recognizable when you compare it to the MiG-21. The F-111 is obviously bigger. There's really no comparison recognition-wise. The only thing we can compare the, is the wing plan form of the MiG-21 against the horizontal stabilizer of the F-111. They're about the same size. We also did comparative performance evaluation between the MiG-21 and our first-line fighters. Overall, the MiG-21 and the F-4 are comparable below 25,000 feet. However, each has limitations that must be considered. The F-4 has greater sustained G available below 20,000 feet and above 425 knots. The MiG-21 has more instantaneous G available at any given airspeed than the F-4. In particular, a 2G advantage between 250 knots and 450 knots calibrated. Above 450 knots, the MiG-21 has 8G available. 
The MiG-21, when flown to optimum, will outturn the F-4 below 400 knots if the F-4 attempts a close-in turning engagement. The MiG-21, with its 55-pound wing loading, is 45% lower than the F-4, and the thrust-to-weight ratios are approximately equal. The fighter combat configured F-4 with missiles, no MERS or TERS, no center line, has superior zoom capability from 10,000 feet to about 30,000 feet. The F-4 has superior level acceleration in burner, both at 30,000 feet from 0.8 to 1.25 Mach and at 15,000 feet up to the Q limit of the MiG-21. The F-4 also has superior level acceleration in military power. Overall, the F-8 and the MiG-21 are comparable airplanes below 15,000 feet. The MiG-21 has approximately a 13% lower wing loading and a 25% greater thrust-to-weight ratio and has more instantaneous G available at a given airspeed. At 10,000 feet, it can sustain a higher G in the 500 knot speed range. At 400 knots and 10,000 feet, the F-8 has approximately 0.5 to 1.0 sustained G advantage. The MiG-21, when flown to optimum, will outturn the F-8 below 400 knots in a close-in engagement, wing up or down. Zoom capabilities are comparable, with differences in external stores and engine trim being the deciding factor. The MiG-21 is superior in military power level acceleration. In combat rated thrust, the aircraft are approximately equal, with the F-8 having a slight edge in the subsonic region with similar external configurations. The MiG-21 has a substantial advantage supersonic. Unloaded combat rated thrust acceleration performance is equal out to approximately 1.2 Mach above 15,000 feet. Longitudinal control response in the F-8 is superior to the MiG-21 below 16,000 feet in the high Q area, above 510 knots. The F-8 has the capability to perform an escape maneuver by exceeding the MiG-21's limiting mark below 16,000 feet. Groups must be used effectively and restrictions adhered to. Tom, would you hand me the 105 model? Up to 15,000 feet, the F-105 and the MiG-21 are closely matched in both military and afterburner power in a clean configuration. Subsonic. Supersonic accelerations were not checked. The F-105 can fly well beyond the MiG-21's low altitude Q limit, below 15,000 feet. This is one of the great advantages. The MiG-21 has a superior zoom capability throughout the envelope of the F-105. The turn comparison, the MiG-21 has a superior turn capability. The F-105 at very high speed and low altitude can initially negate an attack with a very high G turn. And that's about it for the F-105. Now in comparing the F-106 with the MiG-21, at both 10,000 and 35,000 feet, the F-106 accelerates with the MiG in military and maximum power up to the Q limit of the MiG, or Mach 1.2. No acceleration checks were accomplished above 1.2 Mach. The F-106 has a slight advantage between 0.95 and 1.0 Mach in an afterburner acceleration. As most of our other aircraft, the F-106 can accelerate beyond the MiG's Q limit at low altitude. During zooms, the F-106 and the MiG also appear to be closely matched. The MiG-21 appears to have more instantaneous G available below 500 knots, but since wing loadings are comparable, the steady state turn capability is very close. The MiG-21 can maintain a position slightly inside of the F-106 when the F-106 is turning at an optimum angle of attack. Joe, how about the other Air Force airplanes we flew the MiG-21 against? The F-100, it has some capability against the airplane. Of course, uh, it can accelerate with it under most conditions. It can turn with it down at low speed. The F-104, of course, is a very high-speed airplane. It accelerates uh, 
pretty much right along with the MiG-21 during uh, level flight at medium, low, high altitude. In some areas, it's a little better. But of course, the wing loading kills the F-104. Can't turn with him except 1.2 or above. So the 104, uh, comparatively speaking, uh, it's got to use hit and run tactics. Now the F-101, the F-111, and some of the busts we ran against practically have no capability offensively except to exceed the Q limits of the aircraft at low altitude. What about some of your Navy attack airplanes? Well, the A-4 and the A-7, uh, comparable uh, turning ability with the MiG-21. Uh, their low thrust to weight ratio uh, tends to restrict them on the offensive. In all cases, the A-4 and the A-7, by using a brake turn, could counter an attack by the MiG-21 if the brake was initiated at the right time and it was a hard brake. Uh, Close-in scissors, the A-4 and the A-7, maneuvered properly, are actually better airplanes close-in than the MiG-21. Uh, the A-6, with spin assist engaged, was able to uh, counter a MiG-21 attack with a hard brake turn and was actually able to uh, gain the offensive in several cases. Uh, summarizing the, uh, the attack airplanes and actually all the fighter comparisons, during the program, we flew the MiG-21 to maximum performance in order to get the most out of it in our tactical comparisons. The intelligence information on the MiG-21 engagements in the Middle East War and again in the Vietnam War indicate that the MiG is not always flown to max performance. Our attack and fighter bombers have a very real offensive capability. Your decision to press an offensive attack should be made on the tactical situation and based on your opinion of the caliber of the MiG pilot that you encounter. But remember, the MiG-21 has a tremendous turn and maneuvering capability if it's flown properly. Two of the most important things we've learned regarding tactics are, one, the basic maneuvers in the Navy and Air Force tactical manuals are still valid. And two, we must capitalize on the weaknesses of the MiG-21. And this is what we learned in 90 days living with a MiG-21. Does that look like about it, Tom? I think you've got everything up there, Joe. The simplicity, reliability, and maintainability of this aircraft is outstanding. It represents a, an excellent engineering achievement. We flew the aircraft on many occasions, three times a day, turned it around in 30 minutes, it's really a solid airplane. During our 100 flights, we changed the tires and the brakes on the 50th flight, we changed the oil filter on the 50th flight, and we had three very minor uh, electrical problems with the EGT system. That was the sum total of the maintenance on 100 flights. The Q limit of this aircraft is one of the items that we can really exploit. It's really limited compared to most of our tactical aircraft and our fighter aircraft below 15,000 feet. It's one of the items that we really want to work on. Drive the fight down or get out at a low altitude. Keep your mark above 0.95. He gets quite a bit of airframe buffet at 0.93, and the stick is extremely heavy at 510 knots, all below 16,000 feet. This is the area we want to fly in. The visibility limitations out of the MiG-21 is another significant area that we can exploit. Drive to his blind area. It's a very large blind area to the rear. You can't see out very well from the front. You can see out uh, pretty well at the side, but it's one of the areas that most of our aircraft are much better, much, much better designed uh, than this aircraft in that area. The flap above the pilot's uh, headrest is extremely difficult to see around and the four-inch bulletproof windscreen is extremely difficult to see through. You can see F-8, F-4, F-105 type targets at three to five miles. 
However, the airplane can S-turn to get much better visibility out the forward side panels. Detection. The MiG-21 is very small. Frontal view is about the size of an F-104. It's much smaller than many of our aircraft. The engine doesn't smoke under normal flight conditions. Uh, no smoke at all in afterburner. You can see it in a plan view close in, but still remember, it's a very difficult airplane to see. During the program, we averaged less than 25 miles detection ranges on the F-4 radars. We averaged about 15 mile lock-ons with the F-4s. The maneuvering performance. The aircraft will really turn, especially at the right speeds. Below 500 knots and down at low speed. We especially want to stay out of the low speed area, down from 400 knots on down. In this area, uh, if, we, if we keep our speed above this area, we could do very good work with the MiG-21. If we can get the MiG-21 to break and bleed off a lot of energy in the first 90 degrees of turn, we can truly capitalize on this one. Once he's below 400 knots, it's extremely difficult to get his speed back. But remember, his radius of turn is very small, even below 400 knots. His acceleration capability. In the medium speed range, the high altitude speed range, it compares with most of our aircraft. But when he gets down to a low speed, where he loses his energy, it's extremely difficult for him to unload and accelerate out. For example, the F-4, you have a capability of obtaining almost instantaneously 50 knots. The MiG-21 doesn't have this capability at all. He's, he's very slow at accelerating. Offensively, the MiG pilot can uh, pretty much uh, plan his throttle movement. Defensively, however, if he's at cruise power, it takes several seconds to get military power and several more seconds to get afterburner. Climb and zoom capability. Previously, we had thought that the MiG-21 could out-zoom any free world fighter. We demonstrated on many occasions that the F-4 could out-zoom the MiG-21 from 10,000 feet and steady conditions under almost any configuration. This is an area that the aircraft apparently falls short in. The energy maneuverability curves for the MiG-21 that we have appear to be optimistic. Also, uh, our energy maneuverability data on the F-4 appears to be slightly pessimistic. This may account for that particular item. The weapon system for the MiG-21. It's very crude compared to most of our later systems. Uh, it compares favorably with ours about 10 to 15 years ago. Remember, you can beat it. It has some limitations with the gun sight, but the Red Baron can take advantage of a ring and post sight and that relatively slow firing cannon and get in there close and maybe do some good work. So watch this particular item. Remember, a hard turn up to about four Gs will probably defeat the Atoll missile if you see it in flight. The GCI requirements. The MiG-21 and the basic Russian or Soviet bloc countries fighter doctrine is based on a point interceptor capability for the MiG-21. This means it requires GCI. So remember that without a GCI capability, the aircraft is pretty much limited. The MiG-21 pilots are basically trained as interceptor pilots. However, the airplane has a real capability. And when it's employed as a fighter airplane, it's an effective airplane. How about giving us uh, our successful basic tactics, Tom? Generally speaking, in our basic tactics, keep your energy level high cruising, keep your energy level high when you're maneuvering. Above all, be aggressive. Drag the fight down below 16,000 feet. Fly the airplane and fight the airplane on your terms. Provide mutual support. Always maneuver to his blind spot. Exploiting these limitations should prove successful. 
Remember, gentlemen, we're dealing with a Mark II airplane with the turn capability of an A4. Joe, I think we should break out the handbook on the fitter and be prepared to fly it. Raj, 